my first contact with Mega Man was with the amazing Mega Man X when I was about 6 years old. I only came back to the series years later with the equally amazing Mega Man Zero. Since then, I've played almost every single game in the series. In recent years, though, Mega Man has been in a sad dormant state. There have been some rumblings of a revival effort by Capcom, including a reimagined TV series. But as of this video, things have been still for a while, with the last real movement being the release of Mega Man Legacy Collection last year. Mighty Number no. 9, the game that was supposed to be its true successor, was plagued by a rocky development period and received very disappointing reviews, no doubt making developers who wanted to make a game in this genre think twice, despite what it has become recently. Mega Man is one of the biggest video game franchises ever, and has a huge library of games spanning 7 different sub-series. In this series, we're gonna talk about the game that started it all, Mega Man 1 for the Nintendo Entertainment System. If you find this video familiar, you might have already read the text version I made back in 2015. Rest assured though, there is new stuff coming and next week I'm talking about a different game. Mega Man is notable for being one of the most prolific series on the original NES, with an astounding 6 games released between 1987 and 1993. For those who say Capcom milks its series, it's really not anything new. Annualized games aren't a recent thing either. Arguments for the quality of the individual titles are many, but most people agree that Mega Man 2 is better than the first game, even as far as telling others off from playing it. Honestly, while I do agree that 2 is better, 1 is also pretty good. It had some cases of early installment weirdness, naturally, but it's not that much harder than the second game. Unless you count the West-only easy mode in 2. It's not a bad game, by any means. It's still certainly way better than most of the NES library. Mega Man is a very simple game in terms of mechanics. You simply run, shoot, and jump. And it all works. It's simple, intuitive, and, to use an overused term, it feels good. More on that later. One interesting feature Mega Man brought to the world was the way it handled progression. From the beginning, players can freely choose between six stages, each one with a different boss. Each boss gives Mega Man a weapon that he can use at any moment, although with limited uses. Using a system based on rock paper scissors, every boss weapon is strong against another boss meaning that players can overcome bosses against which they have more difficulty by exploiting their weaknesses. Mega Man's original Japanese name is Rockman, based precisely on rock, paper, scissors and also on the musical genre. Probably because of this, Cutman is by far the easiest boss in the game. I suppose Japanese players would catch on to that, but that piece of information was lost when the game was translated. Also worthy of note is the fact that the level selection screen starts with the cursor on Cutman. The fact it has 6 stages open right off the bat gives Mega Man a few advantages, but some problems too. On one hand, the player gets more choice and can play the game in any order with different weapons. This gives the game great replayability, even when it can actually be beaten in about 2 hours or less if you know what you're doing. This is true for most Mega Man games, even those of the X, Zero and ZX series. On the other hand, having all those stages as potentially the first one means that every single one must, at least a little, try to ease the player into the game. This is plausible precisely because of the game's very low complexity. Games on the Zero or X series that follow the formula of freely choosing your path through the game have an opening stage, because they are much more complex than classic Mega Man. There is another flaw to this system. In most games in the series, some boss weapons enable the player to overcome some obstacles that would be otherwise impassable. In the case of Mega Man 1, for example, there are blocks that can be removed using Gutsman's weapon. As the stages can be played in any order, the designers can never know if the player will have a certain weapon when going through one of the Robot Master levels. The result is that special weapons tend to be underused on the level design. 
leaving potentially interesting obstacles only for the final stages, which are only accessible after defeating all the initial bosses. And even that is also potentially a problem, because those weapons have limited uses. How limited depends on the weapon. But sometimes a weapon with about 5 uses is needed to go through one of the final stages, and that results in the place being littered with energy recovery items. It works as an additional element of the challenge, but those sections must always be preceded by recovery items, or the player might simply never use those weapons in fear of being out of energy when they are needed. To make things even worse, the recovery items sometimes only respawn after a game over, meaning that failing in some parts results in having to commit suicide over and over until a game over happens. Finally, having a game that can be beaten so quickly was perfectly normal in the 80s, but that grew more and more unacceptable throughout the years. In the day of open world epics that take hundreds of hours to beat, a quick action platformer might feel like it's not worth the money to a lot of players. Let's get to the game itself, starting by the controls. Mega Man has a very simplistic control scheme. D-pad to move, A button to jump, B button to shoot. That's all. You can pause and change weapons too, but that's extra. As mentioned before, Mega Man notably feels better than other side-scrollers of the time. To use an expression that's frequently used in relation to the Dark Souls series, you rarely feel that a loss was caused by the game screwing you over. It's usually on you. Mega Man is completely under the player's control, except when he's hit, in which case the loss of control in itself is a punishment. Standing on platforms is very lenient. Even with only one leg on solid ground, Mega Man stands firm. This keeps the player from falling too much in narrow platforms. He's a robot. Some leg strength makes sense. Going against most games of its age, Mega Man has a very big health bar that allows for quite a lot of hits. Damage caused by enemies varies a lot, but it's usually about 2 or 3 units out of 28, which is anywhere between 10 and 14 hits. This is quite amazing for a time where touching anything lightly with the very tip of your foot would make you go up in flames in most games. A few enemies do more damage, but those are all enemies that move slowly and hit the player on contact, which means they are easier to avoid. What this all means is that the player can beat the game while being far from perfect. This allows the designers to make stages way harder than they would otherwise be capable of. This also has the side effect of raising the skill ceiling for the game. You can either get through by tanking a lot of hits or by expertly dodging everything. Mega Man runs at a constant speed, there is no acceleration or lag before movement. The moment the player presses the button, he runs. This is the reason why every Mega Man port usually has people very wary about input lag, he needs to respond immediately. Jumping is really fast. Mega Man rises immediately with the button press and stops climbing almost immediately when the button is released. He also falls much faster than what would normally happen with a normal gravity acceleration. Considering Mega Man to be about 1 meter tall, the peak of his jump puts the top of his head about 2 meters above his standing height. He falls from that in 20 frames, or about 0.33 seconds, which results in a gravity of roughly 36 meters per second squared, almost 4 times higher than real gravity, which is about 9.8 meters per second squared. To help illustrate my point, I made a rough approximation of Mega Man's jump using the Unity game engine. You can see how the one on the right, that uses a realistic gravity value, feels very floaty compared to the one on the left, that uses the game's gravity value. As you can see, gravity is very high. This is also true for other platforming games, like Mario for instance. Considering characters with human-like size, Normal gravity feels too floaty if your character can jump above his own body height. Shooting is also extremely responsive, and you can fire as fast as the button can be pressed, with the limitation that there are only up to 3 bullets on screen at any time. When this game was made, that was probably done because of hardware limitations, but this is usually kept even in later games. 
This results in the player having to balance firing speed with accuracy, as firing 3 missed shots really quickly can mean being unable to defend yourself for about 2 seconds. Most enemies can be hit as fast as you can shoot, but bosses have a delay of about 1 second before they can be hit again, which keeps the player from turbo shooting them all into oblivion. The final boss is a notable exception, but the vulnerable area is high and requires jumping. Not only that, but it also takes less damage per shot than most other bosses. There is a little problem with controlling that was fixed in later games. After the player stops running, Mega Man slides a bit. This is the single biggest problem with the gameplay, because it makes Mega Man move more than the player wants to. Especially in the later Wily stages, this can cause more than a few deaths because Mega Man slipped into spikes. As a comparison, the following was captured from Mega Man 3. As you can see, Mega Man stops moving immediately after the player stops running. Speaking of spikes, another flaw that was fixed in later games. When Mega Man is invincible after suffering damage, he still gets killed in one hit by spikes regardless. This makes the first Wily level in particular very infuriating. And while we're in that subject, let's talk a bit about the game's difficulty. No Mega Man is an easy game, but the first one is usually remembered as the hardest, to the point many people never even attempt to play it. This happens for a few reasons. First, there is the aforementioned problem with how spikes work. There is also a lack of energy tanks, items that can instantly recover Mega Man's health when necessary, which are present from the second game onwards. There is also no password system, meaning the game has to be beaten in one sitting. A bit of misinformation I've heard multiple times is that a game over supposedly gets you back to the start of the game. This is wrong, as a game over sends you back to the beginning of the current level like in any other game in the series. Despite the lack of energy tanks, there is one detail that is overlooked. Most Mega Man 1 bosses are actually easier to defeat than those in the sequels, usually taking up to 3 times as much damage per hit. Not only that, but the damage caused by exploiting each boss's weaknesses is much higher than in later games. Some can be defeated in 3 hits, like Elecman and Gutsman. There is one huge, painful and yellow exception though. A boss fight so ridiculously hard that it's always mentioned whenever someone talks about Mega Man 1. The Yellow Devil. Remember when I mentioned that Mega Man has a relatively big health bar, allowing for most of the game to be beaten without that much dodging by the player? This goes completely out of the window on this fight, which happens at the end of the first Wily level. The Yellow Devil divides itself in multiple tiny blobs and sends them to the other side of the room, where it reforms, shoots Mega Man using the red eye that's also its weak spot, and then quickly repeats. The blobs are fast and come in varying heights, but Mega Man can be hit by the two lowest lines when standing. They also do a lot of damage. The secret to beating the Yellow Devil, other than using Elect Man's weapon, his weakness, is memorizing the pattern in which the blobs move. Yes, there's a pattern. And that's where the whole thing breaks down a little. The fight happens at the end of one of the hardest levels in the game, and the player usually doesn't have more than 2 or 3 lives. Combine that with the speed in which the blobs move, and most players won't even know there's a pattern, because after being slaughtered in seconds until a game over, whatever knowledge about such pattern is most likely lost by next time. I know NES games are much harder than current games, but the sheer difficulty spike on this fight makes me think that maybe the designers had some problems creating it. It's pure conjecture, of course, but I can imagine two situations. The developers creating this battle might have gotten used to the difficulty, due to having to test it repeatedly, which means they severely underestimated how hard it is. There was also probably not enough time to test this stage, especially considering it's one of the final levels. This hypothesis is corroborated by another detail that is basically the reason most people could even beat this game in the first place. There is a huge glitch that allows the Yellow Devil to be beaten in seconds by repeatedly pausing when he's being hit by an elect beam. This could have been caught in testing, 
which is why I imagine this fight was probably rushed. Other than that, Mega Man 1 isn't particularly harder than the sequels. Personally, I've had much more difficulty beating the third game than the first one. Well, at this point, I've covered how the game generally works, but now I want to look into things more carefully. In part 2, I'll break down one level of the game and analyze pacing and enemy design. Thanks for watching this video. If you like it, as usual, please consider liking and subscribing. You can also watch my previous analysis on Pokemon Red and Blue and Undertale if you're interested. Come back next week for the first part of a new analysis and the week after that for the conclusion of this Mega Man series. Thanks again and until next time.